Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the CITP seminar. It is my great pleasure to introduce Surya Matu. Surya joined CITP about a year ago, about a year ago, um, where he started the Digital Witness Lab. And this is a very, very exciting development for CITP. Surya comes to us with a background in investigative journalism. He was, for example, a co-author on the paper, uh, the article, Machine Bias, which uh, documented uh, racial bias in the Compass algorithmic scoring system that's used in Florida courts. Um, one of the, you all have probably heard of this paper. This is the, I keep calling it a paper <laughs> and not an article. Um, and that is actually a huge compliment to that piece of work because it was actually two pieces of work. Right. Um, there was an article that had a story about a person that was very interesting and engrossing. And then there was a technical appendix that was basically a paper. <laughs> um, and I remember being really impressed with these kind of dual outputs. Mm -hmm. um, and then we were really lucky to get to meet Surya. And he brings both expertise in both of these kinds of outputs, which makes him um, really an interesting person to bring into our community. Um, Many of the same traditions that researchers bring to their data about being careful, showing your work. These are all things that Surya does in his work, uh, but he brings a kind of different angle. And so one of the great things about CITP, we talk about diversity of backgrounds and interests. Surya brings like some things that we all share and some things that are distinct. And so he's been working on a really big project to study misinformation, and he's going to tell us about it now. Awesome. Welcome, sir. Matt, thank you, folks. All right, nice to meet all of you. Lots of familiar faces, which is nice. Uh, my name is Surya Matu. Uh, and yeah, I'm excited to share what we've basically been up to since we started the lab in November of last year. Um, yeah, so basic stuff. Uh, I'm a data journalist, uh, engineer by training. You know, I kind of went through, I had a meandering path where I started off in engineering went to art school and then ended up in working in journalism because it turns out you can make more money in journalism. Than <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> but for my family, it was very sad that I went from engineering to mm -hmm. art to journalism. <laughs> that trajectory was not what they had invested in, but, uh, <laughs> but it worked out. But yeah, so I spent a lot of time thinking about basically, yeah, the kinds of things a lot of researchers think about, but kind of always thinking about how to communicate complex systems related to technology and the impact on society to a lay audience. I think that's really a big part of the focus of my work is thinking of not just how to tell people what's happening, but give them some sort of intuition and some way of feeling it in the way that they live their own lives. You know, the markup where I used to work before this, shout out to the t-shirt you're wearing. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, well, you were it was on display earlier. Um, <laughs> Uh, I used to say this thing where, like, we you know, we want our readers to have a sense of agency around the role technology plays in their life, not the more common apathy, because that's something that I found that kind of happens again and again with these stories with technology, where it's like big algorithms, science, math, impossible for humans to understand. And then people who actually do understand, like all the people in this room, know that no, it's a lot of human biases that actually still cause most of the problems. And you know you need to kind of sift through the complexity to get get to the place where you understand where the actual challenges lie. And to do that, you need to measure things precisely. That's kind of what I landed on. So that's kind of the the premise of the tree started the digital witness lab is basically trying to take the stuff I've learned from doing this sort of work in journalism, but bridging the gap between the journalism and the and the engineering and the research. And essentially, like over the last ten years, I've seen like a difference in incentive structures that are causing a lot of problems in the public accountability conversation around, around technical systems. The incentives for a career in academia and research and the incentives for a career in journalism sometimes overlap. And when they overlap, it's great. You get some of the best stories, but often they don't. And that's why you know the kinds of things we study are often a, biased by what is easy to study, what is easy to collect data on, or you know where, where there's incentives um, for both industries in different ways to um, to to frame the stories and narratives around it. So the the basic premise of the lab is to collect data from hard to reach places. I think that's something that I've done throughout my career and um, constantly find that it's like something a security researcher once told me actually like the best vulnerabilities come from places where you know when you go deep down enough in the stack that you find like you find the vulnerabilities and I think a similar thing is true for these sorts of stories where 
the bad stuff usually happens when no one's looking. And it's not because like it's necessarily nefarious, it's just that no one is looking there. So there's possibility for a lot of the harms to take place that, you know, so like in the criminal risk assessment story you brought up, we were just documenting what we saw, right? Like our actual story was a truth table. <laughs> like there was a lot of analysis to do with it, but the nut of it was we collected data on 18,000 people and we tried to calculate what it said. It opened up a whole conversation, but that's the, the piece that I think was missing in the in the previous study. So that's really what we're, what we're focusing on in, in our work is trying to collect the data and then make it um, build tools and data sets in ways that allow for this public conversation and kind of to be the infrastructure on which we can build a more nuanced conversation to kind of improve the literacy and the sophistication around which we talk about these systems. Um, so I put this picture up because, you know, I used to joke when I started this lab, I think I said this to you in the in our, in our initial conversation that, you know, I think of myself as a photojournalist in Algorithm City. That's the kind of data journalism I've done. Like, you know, data journalism, like when I started as a journalist was very much related to visualization, not data collection. So most of the emphasis was on like having a data set and then visualizing it to tell a story, not really on um, visual collecting the data in the first place. And the more I've been saying this, the more I've been reading about like early photojournalism, like the 30s and 40s. And this particular picture was from Henry Cartier-Bresson, who's you know considered like one of the pioneers of photojournalism, magnum photography, co-ops, all of this stuff. And I've been reading a lot of their essays. And they wrote at this time, and this is really interesting to me, the similarities between how photojournalists in the 30s and 40s were thinking about their role in the work they do and how I think about the work I do, which is they were really concerned about subjectivity. What do they, you know, what do they frame in the picture? How do they think of composition? How do they think about what they're saying about the world that they're seeing through the picture they take when they do this? So that's kind of one aspect of it. And the other thing is that this technology was new at the time, kind of where we are now. And it was a new way to make sense of the world around us. You know, you didn't have the ability to see the East from a Western lens till, till the 30s and 40s. So a lot of the work, a lot of my work I see as kind of this combination of building the technical tools, but thinking about composition and framing and narrative and precision and all of these things together to figure out how you tell these stories about our time and document things in a way that captured the essence. You know, one thing that all of the photographers from that era talk about is to actually tell a picture, tell the story in a picture, you have to understand the people of that of that place. So, you know, you have to spend time there and you have to get to know them. You have to know what thing is important to understand it. It seems very similar to a lot of the stuff we talk about with data to understand the context, understand the background. So that's something I constantly, I find this frame, framework helpful for myself as I kind of navigate are we doing research? Are we doing journalism? You know, or how does it fit? And this is this feels to me like kind of an in-between place that we're, we're kind of occupying. So I want to start with a case study of how why I think this works and why it's important. So I like to talk about this tool, Blacklight, that I built at the markup. Uh, so Blacklight is a real-time website privacy inspector. Basically, you type in the name of a website and it gives you a real-time result of all the different privacy violations, not all, but a variety <laughs> of different privacy violations that this website might um, be making. You know, it's like eight tests based on a bunch of research that I'll talk about in a second. But the reason we built Blacklight was, it was back in like 2019, I remember the markup, uh, which for the folks who don't know is a nonprofit newsroom that's focused on investigating big tech and tech, tech about accountability in general. Um, and you know, it's 2019 and you we were gonna launch next year. And I was I was tasked with doing something on the surveillance economy, and I was really bummed out because <laughs> You know, at the time, like the, yeah. everyone was talking about the surveillance economy, the New York Times had the privacy, you know, the their privacy series, and it just every day felt like a kick in the stomach. Where it's like, yeah. oh, no one's gonna care when yeah. I put this tool out because there's so much conversation around it. But the thing that I, I identified at the time when I was working on this was that there's this gap between the research and the narrative. So the way people engage with uh, the the surveillance economy tended to be through these stories of these big tech companies that are collecting everything on you, you know, words like Panopticon were always used and all of these kind of like metaphors for the all seeing, all knowing uh, industry. But then when you looked at the research, there was a gap between the reality of a person's lived experience and the way in which things were presented in the study. So like this amazing research that came out of here that I owe a lot of my career to from Arvind and Stephen Angelard, the 
open WPM project and the privacy web census, it taught me a lot about actual things you could measure <laughs> concretely to study the privacy impacts of a particular website. Uh, and it helped me understand like what was actually egregious, you know, and where was the choice with, with, by the website maker, the web developer versus just kind of like big, big tech can kind of track us in a very vague general sense. But so that was really helpful for me. It helped me understand the value of you know what we can measure and where the harms are. But the tools they had were really designed for research, right? So it was a really powerful, OpenWPM is a really powerful platform, but it's really designed for researchers who want to study thousands of websites or hundreds of websites and do kind of a census style survey. It's not helpful for a journalist who wants to study the one website that they are paying attention to, or like the mom or dad who wants to see what their kid's school website is might be doing and how that relates to this larger context. The only tools available to those people were these ad blockers, right? And the ad blockers, they're not really designed to tell you what's happening. They're just designed to block the tracking. So that was basically the gap I identified between the research that existed that really was thorough and important and the tools that were available were trying to fix it without actually getting anyone involved. Um, and that's why we built Blacklight. And that was in, I think, September of 2020. And since then, it's been used a bunch. There have been more than 10 million scans uh, through Blacklight. A bunch of different institutions have used it for their own purposes. You know, the Opioid Institute, ProPublica, Human, right, Human Rights Watch. And the thing I basically learned was like, the point of Blacklight is that it's not it's not perfect. It does not measure everything, but it allows people who are telling this story to add the surveillance economy kind of conversation to whatever thing they care about. And right? you care about reproductive rights. How does surveillance economy play in that? You can actually measure that in an empirical way. Does it tell you everything that's wrong? No, but it, especially for journalists, it kind of helps you get that one statistic that you need for the story, which is like, Hey, this you know this reproductive uh, health center has thirty seven trackers on their website. We don't know why. That seems like a lot. That kind of statistic is used to be really hard to get before the tools like Blacklight, and that's the kind of thing that I think we need more of as we as we do this work. And back to like the you know the photojournalist framing, Blacklight was like a choice, right? These eight tests are not by any means. The only things you can measure, I don't even know that the most important things you can measure, but they were things I could measure with precision, like collect the evidence and then provide to open this up for more questions. And between that and the reporting we did to see how these things actually played out in the real world, that real world, that built the narrative that I think is important when you're trying to build tools that persistently monitor algorithmic platforms, technology, so that you can see how these stories play out over time. I think that's a really important part of it. And uh, that's kind of how I think all of these things go together. So that's work from the past. And now I'd like to talk about WhatsApp Watch, which is the project we're working on now. Um, so WhatsApp Watch is basically, I'm not sure exactly what it is, and it's a lot of different things. <laughs> so I'm just gonna talk through what we've done so far uh, and how we're thinking about it. And first I'll start with why WhatsApp. Uh, so, you know, I spent a lot of time looking at uh, the surveillance economy, so websites, you know, Facebook, spent a lot of time looking at and scraping Facebook and, you know, other kind of online uh, social media platforms. Phones are hard, right? Phones are really hard. Anyone who's having to do like empirical data collection, collecting data from phones is not is non-trivial and more and more important. Uh, WhatsApp, when I started like, digging into it, it blew my mind just how pervasive it is. You know, it's 2 billion monthly active users. That's the same as Instagram. It's like the third most like popular social media platform mm -hmm. on the web. It's also weird to me that it's a social media platform. It's like an encrypted chat app, but it's also a social media platform. The things we're already learning about that are very interesting in terms of how do you scrutinize and measure and test what's happening on a social media platform when everything is end-to-end -end encrypted. Uh, I'm all for end-to-end -end encrypted chats, but it's really making me question, does everything need to be end-to-end -end encrypted when you call something, like when something is considered public, right? Or like, like there's lots of people in it, what does it mean that you can't study it from the outside? I don't know, there's many kind of questions that are coming up for me as I'm doing this research that I hadn't really thought about before, before we started. So yeah, popular the global south. So I'm from India. I've seen firsthand the effect of what, you know, journalists that call WhatsApp University and the steady drip of misinformation, disinformation, and just like hateful content that comes through it. Um, and, and yeah, and, and recently, like there are these elections coming up in India. Okay, so yeah, I'll get to that in a second. So yeah, so we're trying to build a platform to persistently monitor WhatsApp groups, for misinformation and other types of harms. 
uh, you know, so far we've been gathering data from public groups. I put public in quotes because public is not a concept in a WhatsApp group. Uh, public is a heuristic that you basically, like you know, most researchers use to define when something is considered uh, okay to collect data from without the consent of all the people participating in the group. Um, so we have, you know, we're following kind of the, the norms of other researchers. The one I'd like to call shout out is Kiran Garimela, who's I think one of the, you know, four, four the research on the forefront of the space. And essentially it's like when you have more than like, I think their heuristics are like more than 10 people in the group. The group is easy to access, uh, you know, from like public sources. So like currently all the data we're getting is from publicly indexed groups. So we like search for chat.whatsapp.com on Google. All the groups you can join by just clicking the URL. You can just join, there's thousands of people in it. It kind of doesn't matter. That's kind of what loosely is defined as public in the WhatsApp context, but it's much more complicated than that when you go into smaller contexts, uh, like you know, smaller populations and more local contexts. But so we're doing the public group stuff, but we're also looking at different ways to collect data from private groups. And you know, how do we do that in a safe way? In a way that allows us to do content analysis while also limiting the kinds of uh, private information we're collecting. We obviously, you know, anonymize all phone numbers, all names, but like, <laughs> as most people here know, that's kind of bullshit. Like, you know, if you really wanted to get around that, you could. It's a nice thing to say, I think it's important to do, but it's not truly private. And I think it's important to kind of remember, keep that tension uh, like alive as you as you do this sort of work. So that's, that's kind of the data collection aspect of it, but really we're building this platform with journalism investigations in mind. And I think the key difference for me, at least between journalism investigations and academic research is you don't know what you're going to find. <laughs> you know, like I think with a lot of academic research, you're smart. I, don't know, I mean, I don't know, maybe that's the truth for academic research too, but when I read the IRB process, it seems like you have to be really clear about what exactly the thing is that you're studying and how you're going about it. With journalism, you start with that, but you kind of just meander through and hope you get as close to that as you can. And if you don't, you know, you bring the receipts for what you found along the way. And I think by building this, um, by building this uh, platform with that in mind, thinking about the different ways in which, uh, you know, we can study things so that different, you know, patterns and features can emerge from what we're collecting rather than just being very prescriptive about like, we're going to study misinformation. And that means this, because we don't know exactly what <clears throat> it's going to look like and, and what we're going to find. <laughs> so, uh, as I said, when we're starting with India because, you know, it's the platform, uh, it's one of the biggest populations for more than 500 million people in India use WhatsApp, apparently. Um, general elections, coming up next year in 2024, uh, lots of state elections coming up as well. So it feels like a good time to study the role of uh, the platform in like, you know, election. And, you know, from 2019 when the last in Indian elections were, it is clear that the platform had a huge influence on the way people got information and um, the way like there was lots of like harm and kind of calls for inciting violence that took place through the platform. WhatsApp since then has put in limitations of how misinformation spread. You know, they're trying to put policies in place and like tools and techniques to limit the virality of messages and make sure that they can't spread too fast. But what we're learning is it's very hard to measure if any of them work. If all your if all your platforms are end-to-end -end encrypted and your chats are end-to-end -end encrypted, who is monitoring if something is actually spreading? It's and I don't know the answer to it, but as we are seeing the technology, how it works it's very easy to manipulate and it's very easy to fudge those numbers and change them. And we have like, there's research that has evidence of like political parties and, you know, data brokers building custom clients that allow you to kind of side skirt those, those limits in a pretty non-trivial, uh, pretty trivial way, actually. Um, so there's, there's lots of reasons for India. And this is just something that came up a few days ago where WhatsApp introduced this new feature called channels. And essentially it's a broadcast mechanism for people, for celebrity. I don't know how they decide who gets to have a channel, mm -hmm. uh, but for people to broadcast messages to, to huge populations. So this is Narendra Modi, the prime minister of India's channel. I This was, seven, it was 7.9 million followers two days ago when I took the mm -hmm. screenshot and today it's 8.5 million followers. And it's like, okay, so this, this is just like straight into, you know, straight into like the phones of 8 million people but it's an end-to-end -end encrypted chat platform, but it's also got kind of got this like broadcast mechanism of television. So it's kind of doing all of these things at the same time and it makes it really hard to study, I think. 
but I think also really interesting because the ways in which all these things play together to me at least are very fascinating. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of why we're focusing on India. These are the three hypotheses that we're loosely kind of you know kind of focusing on as we as we do the data collection. The first one is related to, as I mentioned earlier, these frequently forwarded labels and uh, ways of limiting the spread of content on the platform. It's kind of nonsense, really. Like, like the way in which they determine when something is frequently forwarded is that the client increments the, a forward count attribute on a message. Because messages are end-to-end -end encrypted, there's no centralized system where these counts are being measured. So if you have a client that's kind of you know, tweaked, let's say, you can just reset the count down to zero and make sure that it's never, it's never considered frequently forwarded. It also lets you do things like get around the number of people you can send a message to because you can, I mean, this is just like complicated technical things, but you could literally just copy paste the message into the text and resend it and clear that as well. So you don't even need um, like all the crazy, you know, JavaScript or whatever. But what we're trying to focus on is finding instances in the real world of people actually doing this, right? So like, what does this look like on the ground? What does it look like when political uh, operatives, people for whatever reasons might be using these techniques for their own purposes? And again, because it's so hard to study, WhatsApp just gets to say, we did it, <laughs> we solved the problem. But again, because of the difficulty and challenge of studying this stuff, we think it's really important to actually collect data like from the ground to see that if it's working the way they say it does. Mm. Um, the second hypothesis I basically got from this really great newsletter I recommend you guys all read, the AI snake oil. Have you heard of it? <laughs> but, um, it's, I think it's an important one. I think it really speaks to this uh, point of uh, misinformation generation is, is a bottleneck. It's not really the bottleneck, it's the distribution. And even just from the, the how far we've reached so far, it's kind of amazing to watch what, um, I think I was saying this to someone uh, at CATP a few weeks ago where Facebook and you know Twitter, those those feel like TV. Like they feel like, uh, like a, even though it's like it's a two-way communication, it's still kind of a broadcast, centralized broadcast mechanism where there's these pages and then these accounts and there's this official way of communicating with people in a broadcast way. Uh, WhatsApp really feels like dotted or knocking. Like the, the organizational structure that's gone into building different WhatsApp groups to uh, target and profile voters in places like India is nuts. Like I'm still early in like seeing what this looks like on the ground, but it's really amazing the kinds of stuff we've just seen like hints of evidence of, of like how government databases and uh, they, like profiles of people can be used to then put them into different WhatsApp groups to then send their messages around particular profiles and you know particular campaigning strategies. And again, it's all happening on these distributed chat, uh, you know, groups where no one even knows what the other person is seeing, even though they're all like living in the same community. So there's a bunch of different kind of again things that are at play over here. Uh, yeah. My, my question. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Could you explain what you mean by put people into groups that think that WhatsApp allows it? To? Uh, yes. So you can actually. Well, there's it's a couple of different things that you can do. One is that uh, you. It, I think I'm not sure if it still works in the same way, but you can actually just add a phone number into a group, and then you are a part of that group. I don't think you need permission to add someone into a group. Um, and also people just knock on their like knock on people's like you know. People who work for parties would knock on people's door and say, "Hey, join this group." So it's it's not even so like sophisticated. It's like, give me your Aadhaar number and join this group. And people do it because they don't know better, or you know, they trust that this is for a greater purpose. So it's very trivial, really. Um, Can I ask another question yeah. about um, you talk some about difference between journalism and research, and I wonder what you mean by hypotheses here. Well, yeah, exactly. So this is so this is I, I would say that these are the these are the the three narrative themes that I'm really kind of targeting okay. in terms of the ways in which we're building the platform uh, and deciding what attributes to pay attention to in the data we collect, uh, what things not to pay attention to. Uh, again, in that composition of the different tests we might be running, these are the these are the things that I think are important to study here. Um, that's 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 really what I what I mean. Um, Okay, so a lot of it takes a lot of people to do this work. When we started a year ago, it was the two people on the top left. Mm -hmm. and now it's all these people. Uh, so I'm just going to walk through everyone who's working on this for a second. So Misha Gorlick, my co-founder and like the engineering brain behind all of this. She's the person responsible for all the amazing the platforms that we've built so far that I'll talk about in a second. 
Claudia Jaswinska, who's our first real, you know, team member. She's been a part of our work for like, I think like six months now and has been really instrumental in making sure all of the ship <laughs> sails. Uh, Kumar Sambhav Srivastav, he's a journalist and researcher based out of India who's uh, who's taking the, who's got the title of India Research Lead and he's responsible for, you know, going out into the different towns and places where these elections are taking place to actually start doing data collection on the ground. Um, he's done some really amazing and important reporting in the past on, on you know, the tech stack in India and the ways in which uh, national databases are being used to profile uh, voters in a way that really shouldn't be allowed, but is 100% legal. That law changed a couple of years ago in India, um, and he has a really good keen eye on that. Jeremy Singervine is our part-time data editor. Uh, Jeremy used to be the data editor for BuzzFeed um, and is just really, again, one of those people who can put on the, both the researcher and uh, you know analysis hats. He has a really great newsletter called Data is Cleaner that I highly recommend uh, if you aren't already subscribing to it. Uh, Archana Lawat, who I'm not sure she's here, but she's a seen other CITP emerging scholar who uh, is the software engineer working with us on the platform. Shishti Jaswal, who is the first journalist uh, who we're collaborating with. Uh, Shishti is a fellow at the Pulitzer Center, and um, you know she's actually studying the impact of WhatsApp on her small, uh, her hometown. So she's from a town in in in, uh, in India called Mandi in the state of Himachal Pradesh, and she, you know she pitched the story for studying the impact of the platform uh, during these upcoming elections in her town. So it's really nice for us because it's kind of a contained environment to really see all the different dynamics of that are playing out over there. Um, Sarah Scheffler uh, and Madeline Zhao are working with us on the privacy research component of the text analysis that we're doing. So lots of people, lots of moving parts. Uh, running out of time, so I'm just going to now quickly run through what we're actually doing. <laughs> uh, so three different kind of tracks of how we're thinking about this work, the computer science and engineering reporting and the qualitative research. Uh, we think you need all of them really to do this work in a meaningful way. Um, so, so far, most of our efforts have gone into building the data collection platform. You know, the platform is now running. We basically, it's kind of like a wrapper over like the WhatsApp web API that is used to, um, you know, um, build the WhatsApp desktop client, if anyone's ever used that. Uh, a bunch of moving parts, but essentially we can persistently monitor groups uh, that are joined into our platform. Um, yeah, we uh, are currently beginning to start working on the analysis tools and the different ways in which we're going to study the content that's coming in. But so far, all the data we've got is from publicly indexed groups. These are just groups, like I said, <laughs> that you can find by searching on Google, like <clears throat> chat.whatsapp.com and, and the URLs. And then the really fun thing is this user interaction via chatbots, uh, which I'll talk about more in a second. But uh, we basically just realized that a lot of the journalists we're working with are are already using WhatsApp as their main like source for uh, sourcing and contacts. So we're building tools to allow them to do data analysis and queries off the data we're collecting through the platform itself. Um, and we're kind of in the early stages of that. But this is uh, true as of yesterday. Uh, you know, so we started collecting data on the 1st of September. We have 343,000 messages. You know, so the, the, the pipes work, they can have been stress tested, you can get 20,000 messages a day and nothing breaks. Uh, currently, as I said, all of these groups are publicly indexed, things that are, there's no expectation of privacy. Most of the messages in here are spam and scams. I don't think there's actually real people in here anymore, but it's still helpful for us as a starting point um, to just see if everything kind of works. Um, if there are people from India here, they'll know what Jawan first day for show means. That was Shah Rukh Khan's new movie that came out uh, a, a month ago. And like, I don't know why <laughs> it's one of the most popular uh, WhatsApp groups, but it is. Um, so yeah, so, so you know, data's coming in, the, the platform is actually working. And then this is, uh, this is really fun. So this is uh, one of like, this is like a prototype example of one of the bots and sorts of services we're building into the platform. Um, so we have this, uh, so I should pause it here. So basically Cool Friends is our WhatsApp community with a bunch of bots that we built. We're not very good at naming things. But, um, <laughs> sorry, Misha, if you're watching this online. Um, but basically the idea is that you can send a message to this group with the one, one of the services. So if you've used the command line tool, it's kind of like currently structured as a command line tool. Eventually we make it a more like narrative driven interface, but so we, you can basically like hit the database bot with like a query and it'll, Hit this, send this to our backend, and generate for you 
the data that you are requesting, which in this case is the country codes or distribution of country codes for all the groups that we're a part of. And then you can download the CSV. Um, you know, obviously you're not going to look at a CSV in your phone. We'll do more okay. useful things over time with the ability to um, kind of communicate with the data directly. Again, I think it's something where it's like the journalism versus research. Sometimes you're going to have an anecdote or a story as you're reporting, and you want to want to see if you have the data for that or how that affects what you've seen in the stuff you're looking at on the data side. So we're trying to build all the tools to make it easy and dynamic for the people on the ground to actually query what we've got, uh, what we've collected so far. Uh, so that's the engineering and the privacy research. So the way we're thinking about how we get around the issue of collecting data from private groups, groups where we, you know, where there isn't a really a reasonable expectation that uh, the information is not private. Uh, and this is like ongoing research. We are not sure how far we're going to get and how successful this is going to be. But the idea is essentially to use like large language models to do semantic search over the text as we get them in. So, you know, you have text, convert them into embeddings and then mm -hmm. use them to run queries over, over the text as they come in. That kind of that part makes sense, but we're essentially thinking of it as like three tiers of uh, of privacy. So, the, so that kind of model works for everything. But the idea is to add um, kind of statistical noise and make the make the embeddings differentially private. Madeline, correct me wherever I'm wrong in what I'm saying over here, since you are working on this uh, at the moment. But uh, yeah, we're trying to figure out how to make the embeddings differentially private so you add enough statistical noise that you can get some kind of sense of what is going through the content without an exact set, exact kind of uh, measurement of it. Uh, and you know, this is the sort of thing that we hope in the future will make it possible for people to share content from private groups without worrying about us ever reading the messages or seeing what's in there. And rather than storing the data directly, we can be clear about what queries you want to run off the, the data we're collecting beforehand. So even giving them the option to decide whether they want to share it for those purposes or not. And then the homomorphically encrypted mode for hiding, I don't even know what that means yet. I've heard it's cool, but Sarah and Madeline are working on this and it sounds great to me that if we can do that, it seems even better and more useful for <laughs> collecting data in a privacy preserving manner. Um, but yeah, we're super early on 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 that stage uh, on that stage of things right now. Um, <clears throat> any questions? Probably a lot. So I'll just quickly go through, and then we can talk more. Um, so then that's the engineering side. And as I said, so now that we have a platform and ways to collect the data, we're actually now going out in the field and start figuring out where to do our data collection. So we're looking at different places where elections are coming up in the coming months. Andhra Pradesh and Telangana are two states where we, the elections coming up, where there's lots of documented evidence of this kind of targeting and profiling taking place already. So there's many, again, different things that we're trying to study. We're using the elections as a way to kind of build the, the local context of where we think we're going to collect the data. But the types of misinformation and profiling and targeting that we're seeing are actually beyond just the elections. like. It's uh there's there's like hey like basically there seems to be two tiers of messaging that happens. One is directly from the political parties or the campaigns, and then there's this like other um, WhatsApp influencers who push content into into the groups, which is not directly like there's no official correlation or connection to the party, but the messaging is similar, just far more vitriolic and you know and like this is an example of the kinds of conspiracy theories that go through these groups. There's one um, called Love Jihad, which is basically a conspiracy theory that claims that Muslim men are trying to uh, marry Hindu women to, um, you know, to capture them and convert them so that we can have a Muslim majority population in the country or something like that. We see those types of messages coming through as well. Now, that's not directly related to any particular political campaigning, but it has the baseline effect of like increasing the vitriol that's going through these systems. And we're seeing we're seeing that as well. So we're going to be measuring and monitoring all of that. Again, specific towns, local context. We're not going to make generalized claims about what this means with the platform, but hopefully we'll find meaningful anecdotes and stories that can can help us get to further research. Um, and then at the back end of all of that, like once we collect this data from these groups and it starts coming in, we have to actually do qualitative research to analyze the content, kind of come up with the frame of how we're studying it. How, what kinds of things we're measuring of it and you know how we're labeling and tagging and annotating it before we can make any claims about what, what stuff we're seeing. So the idea here is basically um, we think that there's going to be 
over the election cycle, a lot of different news events, you know, different things that take place in a particular place. We want to be able to codify all of those different ones so we can show the different cadences of specific things that went through those groups with, while providing context of, of what that means. Currently, the way we're building the process for all of this is through um, looking at the scam and spam that we've collected because we have a lot of it. But that's also an iterative process that, you know, as we start getting data uh, from the ground, we probably update as we go along. Um, so yeah, as I said, next steps, gather data for the upcoming elections and start. And then, yeah, finally, it start prototyping tools and resources for journalists. One thing that's already becoming clear to me, at least, that's really missing uh, in the WhatsApp conversation is a way to analyze a group you're a part of. So I'm thinking of like a prototype tool that allows you to kind of share all the data from a given group and get like blacklight style results of like, you know, different tests of like, okay, in this group, there's these many messages that come from these sources, there's these many messages that these fact checkers have set up misinformation or labeled in this way and finding different ways in which you can build that composition so that again, for people on the ground who are doing the reporting, they get this like snapshot view of a given system to better understand the context. So we're thinking about tools like that. And finally, for students, if you want to play with 300,000 scammy messages on WhatsApp, please okay. get in touch. Uh, and if you're interested in using some of the uh, infrastructure we built for your own purposes, you know, it's well documented. We can we can help you out. Uh, we want to like help. And you know, if you're interested in any of this stuff, please get in touch and we'd be happy to chat. Um, so yeah, I think that's everything. I would love to take your questions. Um, with respect to like India, like if you have to sign up for a mobile number, you also need to give them your Aadhaar card. Yes. Is there a sense that that's where they're getting our mobile numbers, or how is the government getting other people's? Ah, uh, they just ask. They usually just go knock on the door and ask because from the voter pro the Aadhaar, you already have phone numbers. But the way they're building these databases, they actually have the voter the voter lists, and then they just go knock on the door and then fill the data from from those. Yeah. Have you thought about like how you're going to go about the distribution of the results that you find? Because it's very plausible that the people who are like victims of this misinformation are not plugged into like academic research or journalistic organizations or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, I, it's important. I'm, I'm not. It depends on what we find. I think so. You know, we're not. It's, so this is why I, again, I think of it more as journalism first because we can just provide them the story and give them a chance to comment on it and like you know provide our findings, especially if it's someone who's affected directly by something that happened. Um, but at a high level, we will you know kind of what Matt was saying earlier. All the methods mm -hmm. and the stuff we've done, like we lean into our limitations. So whatever claims you make, we we'll make sure to be clear about. What we are and aren't saying make whatever data we can available to others so that they can see it themselves as well. But that ex but exactly what that looks like will kind of depend on, on what we find. Yeah, uh, so it's fascinating stuff. And you know, one of the questions around accountability is which way are you pointing, right? So it sounds like part of what you're trying to point to is platform accountability and what is WhatsApp going to do with it. Um, but the other part, which sounds like you're also interested in is sort of the users of that platform, right? They, they may be the ones who are equivalent to doing the door-to-door -door laughing mm -hmm. and other bad actors. Um, but some of the measures that you're taking to protect the privacy of those communications make that second kind of accountability harder. Yeah. And so how are you thinking through sort of how to balance this? So I think I, there's, a, there's a clear distinction in my, in my head of like what comes through the pipes of this platform and what is just stuff that we get from on the ground reporting and anecdotes. So like, you know, we need this data to help find patterns that we can, we can tell, but you're already like, you know, there's information that we're collecting that isn't going to come through here that you don't really need the data evidence in the same way to make the claim. You can have the one message from the person on the, like, this is an example, like, you know, uh, We've seen uh, people get messages in WhatsApp groups for like um, campaigning related to welfare schemes they're a part of. So it's like, hey, you got that gas subsidy, vote for so and so, and you know, you'll be sure to get it again. And that's a like clear evidence that a particular data set that really shouldn't be used for profiling is being used. And like, you don't need the full uh, the full kind of study for that. And, and again. I think academic researchers who go through the full sort of like, you know, IRB process, full kind of clarity of how to do that in a careful way, can study that at scale, but at least you can provide the evidence that it's, it's happening. Yeah. 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 Ye
Um, I'm interested in how you think about sampling and then particularly also how that relates to the kinds of things you want to find. So you mentioned finding an example of a specific thing, in which case you only need to just prove that it exists. A different goal would be to say like 10% of what's coming through this platform is misinformation or something like that. Do you have a sense of what, which of those goals you have and how that impacts how you think about sampling? So I'm thinking of the first one because Kieran's doing the second one. Ah, okay. So he's, uh, you know, he's really thinking deeply about how to build a representative sample mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in India and Brazil, I think he's starting with. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just kind of leaning on him, him for, uh, for thinking about like the, you know, how to make those kinds of claims. So the way I kind of understand what he's going for is being able to say, uh, you know, this is going viral on WhatsApp mm -hmm. and then and say there with some kind of statistical mm -hmm. uh, claim, but what he's not going to get from that is the ability to see how that actually necessarily impacts people and the different mechanisms that don't make it to that high, like, you know, the high volume impact where it could be as potent. Mm -hmm. um, this was super interesting. Um, so I studied disinformation primarily in the U.S. context, and I was wondering what definition of disinformation you're using and sort of what are you, what how do you determine whether something is disinformation or not well i think there's a couple of different which is not a couple many different yeah. ways in which you can you can think about it right so i think one is um looking at uh talking points that are coming from political actors yeah. that are false uh that are proven false and they are being spread um the second is kind of this more like you know like i was saying the love jihad thing mm -hmm. where it's like it's really is kind of fuzzy, but it's not it's not here also where it's coming from and trying to see if we can build some kind of like trace to measure uh, um, you know the sourcing. But a lot of our focus is more on the sourcing aspect of it rather than the content analysis itself. So mm -hmm. if I can, but in my ideal world, what I would like to have is be like, uh, like, you know, my eyes on a bunch of different sources of like YouTube channels, uh, WhatsApp channels, TikTok, whatever, yeah. uh, apps from political parties, see the content going through those and seeing how similar the content we're seeing in the groups are so that you can do an assessment of these talking points hadn't come up in this group before this, but as of yesterday, it started here and then we see that pass on over here. So it's more, it's coming from, from that place. So you can sort of identify, like you said, in your second hypothesis, the distributors, the amplifiers. Yes. Yeah. And that's, that's our goal, right? It's yeah. actually to talk more about like, yes, the platform and there's a platform accountability angle, but there's also the angle of like how a platform like this can is being utilized by people on the ground for their own purpose. I don't think it's all WhatsApp's fault that that's happening, but I think we need to be clear about the fact that it is happening and it is very powerful yeah. in, in controlling the narrative. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. I have three questions. The first one is actually motivated by um, yeah, uh, uh, the question on misinformation and disinformation. So uh, is there a fact-checking instance in your platform? There will be, yeah. We're, we're, we're talking to fact-checkers on the ground who are already building these databases to figure out how we can um, how we can basically integrate that data with ours. But again, we're still in the early stage of the analysis side to figure out the exact ways in which those things will work together. The second question, so uh, maybe it's uh, of a clarificatory uh, nature. So um, is the staff on your project now, are they acting as participants, observers inside the group, or, uh, inside the, the relevant groups? Are they infiltrating in a way? And how do you think about the ethics? Yeah, so they disclose, so they disclose that they're journalists, like the, 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 the journalist who's a part of the groups in her community has disclosed that she's a part of, she's a journalist, that she's working on a project related to this stuff. Um, we don't collect data from groups, you know, so we, we follow the same heuristics that other researchers already have around like what we consider to be public and groups that are okay to get information from. Um, most of the, almost all the groups are looking, so like I said, from the platform, we're currently only getting these publicly indexed groups at the moment, but even going forward, we're going to be clear about the get, only putting data in here that is clearly for broadcast. Right, for for the spread of information, not where conversations are happening kind of organically within the community, and some of those things are basically uh, determinable just by looking at the at the information, talking to the people before we join the groups, and you know maybe talking to group admins. That's another way that I've seen um, researchers uh, go about this as well, disclosing what we're up to with the admins and then asking them if it's okay or not. Maybe for some instances, we even disclose within. Um, the platform that we are here. So it kind of depends again on 
we, we again the, the platform is built so that we can do all of those things. It just depends on when we we need to do the channel. Final question you have on your team the journalist and research lead is going to frame the research, uh, the narrative around the research uh, in such a way as yeah, I mean, she's targeting her community and she wants to uh, reach out to the primarily. And I was wondering what were the considerations driving that uh, design aspect of your project? Were they pragmatic, epistemological, ethical? Sure. So, um, so she, the the place she lives in is like an interesting kind of like case study for a small town in India that has like a Hindu majority population, but is actually not um, in the in the, in the BJP state. It's in the Congress. It's from a different political party. Um, there are uh, there's clearly evidence on the ground of like uh, there being campaigning taking place in that town and and it's it's uh, and in that district in general. So it just felt like a good. Uh, a good kind of place to start with uh, where, you know, she's there, she's well known, it's kind of, you're not like parachuting and she understands the local context and we could use that to then see how to study maybe other places when we learn from there. Hey, um, I just had a question. I mean, I could be wrong about this, but like my sense is, so I guess my question is how are you thinking about age? And so what I have in mind is that presumably a lot of people who are in these groups uh, older I would imagine that like definitely yeah. it's older it's uncles and aunties right yeah. so I don't know do you have like a sense of like how that's playing into the narratives that you're putting forward so I don't know if that's true actually that, that it's all uncles and aunties because we've seen already in just some of the reporting and like look at the local data that like there are WhatsApp groups made by political parties that are targeting teenagers, that are targeting like you know young women, business, like the the ways in which this this slice and dice the demographics are far more specific than I expected. Uh, so we're looking at things like age, we're looking at things like caste. All of these play into the way these profiles are actually being made um, at the ground level. Um, but 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 you're right. Like I think like at least, and this is the distinction between like the sort of organic content you might get in your family WhatsApp group versus like the, the source of the sorts of groups are talking, the political party groups are talking about where they really are broadcasting out particular talking points. And I think you can see the distinction there. So we're currently focusing more on those where we can say like with some clarity that, you know, there's an intent for sharing this information forward and broadcast ideologically for people. Um, I think a few weeks ago, WhatsApp rolled out this optional maybe as a chat AI bot mm -hmm. for personality. So I'm thinking that also a kind of push into different populations. So I was thinking, if, I was uh, wondering if your group also is looking into that or maybe into the person. Yeah, that one, it just took kind of mm -hmm. caught us off guard because I saw like, I think Padma Lakshmi is now a bot on 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 on, on WhatsApp. So I don't even know how to think about that yet. But it's something that I need to pay. again. I'm going to wait to see how how people actually use it on the ground. But yeah, and again, it speaks to the larger point of like it's like an AI chatbot. It's also a social media platform. It's also this broadcast mechanism. So it's it's a kind of these multi headed hydra. I have a question related to this, but more on the engineering part. So how do you make sure that the systems are flexible enough to react to changes in the API or in the software? Mm. But also, how do you ensure that it works? For example, if CEOs decide they shut down APIs at some point. Um, well, yeah. Yeah, there's a <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> the answer is like. Oh. <laughs> uh, but the the thing we do to, to to deal with that is we try to just be, be very careful, you know, and like we're monitoring. Uh, the infrastructure we rely on is very similar, almost the same as what the WhatsApp desktop client relies on. So if they're going to shut us down, they're basically shutting that down. So if they're shutting that down, it's more likely to be a bigger problem where maybe our project won't matter as much in the in the grand scheme of things. Uh, but yeah, it's always it's always a concern, and it's a cat and mouse game. Like this is something that um, it's honestly it was a bigger problem I think when I was doing Facebook related work because they act actively had like an anti scraping team that was doing just the craziest stuff to make it hard to, to, to scrape their website. Uh, we haven't really seen that happen uh, with, with WhatsApp yet. You briefly mentioned objectivity, and I was wondering if you could riff on that a bit. I want to give you a couple of prompts, you know, feel free to react to yeah. any of them. 
Uh, one is just what is your personal commitment to objectivity? How do you know when it's met? Is there a trade off with uh, a narrative, which you also mentioned is super important? And the other one is the famous book on the history of objectivity, uh, which lists three phases to the nature, technical objectivity, and frame judgment. If, if that sounds familiar, you know, if, is, is that a helpful way of thinking about it? Where would you put yourself? Yeah, I think. Um... I think I'm in that first camp of the, of the three of like just really trying to. I I don't I don't think I'm I, I think like I, again that's where I go back to the photojournalism thing where I'm fully aware of the subjective nature of where we're pointing our tools and where we're trying to collect the data from and the limitations of what what that brings with it. Um, <clears throat> and honestly, my best answer is just to be really careful and precise about what, when we find things, what we say about them, so that when people try to make other claims based on our findings, we can fact check and correct them to say, we didn't say that, we said this. That's that's a mis misinterpretation of, of what we what we've actually found. So um so I think like my 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 commitment to objectivity is more as a as a trade-off to spicy spiciness level of a story, right? Like I would much rather tell a much more boring story, but that I think actually maybe provide some new information to the world about how something is working that isn't well documented, uh, at the cost of saying that like, you know, like this party is evil because they're doing this and this party and WhatsApp is evil because they're doing that. I think for me, like the the real goal is to try to build that intuitive sense of how these platforms work and are affecting our lives. And then, uh, and I think a lot of that can be done through anecdotes and through particular examples, because at least with journalism and journalism beats, it's like when you do that first story, it opens up more examples of how those things play out. And um, and in most of the work I've done, I usually find those, you know, kind of like examples that I think elucidated type of harm that might be important to study that you can then do the more rigorous mechanical sort of object objective study around. I have a question about the end-to-end -end encryption. Yeah. So I, one is a question of clarification is just if it's encrypted, how are you seeing it? And what, what does end-to-end -end encrypted really mean in this context? Um, and then the second question is about how the information you can get is similar to or different than what WhatsApp has. So I'm used to studies of other social media platforms where the goal is to get what it, the company has and from the outside, it's always kind of second best. Are you saying that, like, is there information that WhatsApp has that you would want or is it really the case that like, you know, as much as they do? I, so they, so end to end encryption yeah. in our sense is that we have to go into the groups ourselves so that we we don't need to worry about breaking the encryption yeah. or anything. We're just we're members of the group or we're getting data from people who are parts of the group. Okay. So we so the way to the so the the so that that, that matters for so the second point you bring up where they at least as far as I can tell and from what WhatsApp claims they do not have insight into what's happening within these groups and, and the content that's generating through it. So in theory, we, we will have bigger, more robust data sets of what's going through in these WhatsApp groups than, than they do. But do they have information, for example, about the number of messages posted or things that you might not have? So I don't, they no. don't they're not really clear about exactly what, what they make available, but I can say like, like and that's why we had that frequently forwarded label mm -hmm. uh, uh, aim is like, we can see that they do not, there's no way for them to check that other than the fact that the message goes from one person to the next and, and it's incremented. Um, so that's that's always a, yeah. So I don't think they have more, they have additional, I don't know if they have metadata on the groups and the participants, presumably they do. They also presumably have activity information about the people and their devices and things like, things like that. But the actual content and messages going through the groups, I don't think they have that. Thank you. Are you authorized to run metric analysis from the outside? Well, we're not even going through, we're not doing that. Right? We're just we're collecting data from within the groups to, uh, by the kind of the mechanism that is connected. I'm just curious about the type of data which is shared on these public WhatsApp groups. I'm, I'm not part of them. I, so I'm just curious. I am part of private groups, though, like I have a large family and most of them are like aligned to a specific ideology. So the type of content shared in that is scary sometimes. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious as to how open and free are the discussions on these public groups, 
given that your identity is kind of associated right it's like a phone number unlike say reddit or something yeah like so these these office. groups are super scammy like i think they were groups that were made for other purposes years ago and they've just kind of been mm-hmm. repurposed for it's basically a bunch of links to crypto scams and <laughs> other types you know is that kind of stuff that's coming through here um, but to your second point, I think that's again very related to the nature of the platform itself. That like I don't think all WhatsApp groups are the same, and the way I think WhatsApp groups are a very different concept than a Facebook page, for example. I think Facebook pages fundamentally serve the same purpose for different types of entities, but with WhatsApp, even though the interface and the mechanics of how the the group works are the same, the purposes and the context are, can be very different. Right? Like so, when you have um, your 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 like local police station has a WhatsApp group to make people aware in the neighborhood of what's happening there. That's a WhatsApp group, which is again different. So, so we look a lot at the at those types of dynamics of the the you know the context in which a group exists and what what its purpose is when we're looking through it. And we still it's still early days for us to say exactly what types of uh, content we're seeing from from just the reporting side of it. It's um. It's very clear that the, the the group title and description give you enough information about what what the purpose of that group is. Yeah. And so one of the things you talked about in your earlier talk was the importance of persistent monitoring over the scale of years, and I'm wondering how you're thinking about that kind of time scale as you're building your current system. Well, so I think it goes to the black light thing, right? I, I want to see what we can measure in a meaningful way through the system that allows other people to check it for themselves. And those might not be the, per- they will definitely not be the perfect metrics. Hopefully they're good enough metrics that people can then use to, to study this stuff over time. But are you doing anything now to like ensure, like do you have like a f- five-year plan or like, ha- or do you have budget for five years of maintenance or like, are there things you're doing now to think about? We're building that? it to basically collect to, to persistently monitor. Yeah, okay. so we're, yeah, we're building it in, with that in mind. Like the data is all stored in flat files. Mm-hmm. You know, like we the data, like the, the infrastructure is built in a very pragmatic way to to keep as much of it as we can at the lowest cost possible, and like you know, like spin up studies of particular pieces as we need. So it, it, we do all of that sort of stuff. Um, but but yeah, I mean, okay. it, yeah, <laughs> depends. Sorry, kind of more downstream question. So, um, from my understanding, this tool we kind of like that like we enter like the link to like call like an open call center, and you can see like what are the potential um, like exposure. So, I'm curious to see because for people who like sign up to like join these type of groups, they're probably like bought into the ideology, right? So, how do you even get the people who are most likely to be subject to these attacks or danger to like? Yeah. yeah, so I actually don't think of it, uh, that's a good point, thanks for bringing it up, because for me, like the ideal tool, and I don't think I'm going to be able to build this, is not actually to send it a link, is to actually make an app where you can like scan your QR code like you would to connect the desktop client and have a local instance to study all the messages you have on your uh, on your device without sending it to us at all. So that's where the privacy research comes in, but like Madeline's working on is like, can we study those messages locally on your device so that you can assess all your groups, including your super private groups, but not sending us any of, of the data. But TBD if we're able to actually uh, do that. But that's the goal with with that analysis. Yeah. Thank you.